Good afternoon. On behalf of the citizens of Dublin, I want to welcome to this important and unique occasion the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, Tónishta Eamon Gilmore TD, Ministers Quinn, Dinehan and Costello, Deputies, Councillors, Members of the European Parliament, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, President of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, John Douglas, General Secretary David Begg, Francis O'Grady, General Secretary of the British Trade Union Congress, Bernadette Segal, European Trade Union Confederation, Sharon Burrow, International Trade Union Confederation, and of course, all of you here today. We've gathered here today to remember and pay tribute to those people who were involved in the 1913 lockout. Not just the well-known figures like James Larkin, but also the thousands of working men and women who took part in this campaign to achieve decent treatment and fairness at work, and ultimately social justice and equality. Critical to the events of 100 years ago was the right of workers to organize through their union and to collectively bargain with their employers. This is an issue that has yet to be resolved, and it's important that we in this generation pledge ourselves to complete the campaign started by our forebears 100 years ago. Today's events aren't just about reflecting on the serious issues that we still have to tackle in this society. They're also about celebrating the key role working men and women, their families and communities played in the creation of an independent Irish state. As the President has previously said, a knowledge of history is intrinsic to citizenship. And our presence here today strengthens us as citizens committed to bringing progress to our country. On behalf of Dublin City Council and all of those involved in organizing today's events, I hope you all have an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We'd like to welcome Kira Sedin on stage with Conor Brady. Hello, good afternoon. It's, a, it's an honor to be here commemorating this such a pivotal and uh, remarkable event in Irish history. The song I'm going to sing is uh, a song that I wrote to mark a social cause of justice, I suppose, that's very relevant today and uh, for whom I'm sure the leaders and those who partook in the, the lockout revolt would certainly have an affinity and that's the women of the Magdalen Laundries, who, as we know, were, were forced to work uh, for free against their will and who are still awaiting and hopefully soon to receive compensation. There's an aspect of their experience that can never be compensated and that is having their children taken from them, again, without their consent. And that's what this song marks. Um, looking at their testimony over years, it's clear that despite their very individual experiences, there's a commonality. And that is a sense that if they could give a message to their children over years and decades, that they would want them to know that they never let them go. And this is called My Finest Flower. There's a valley of stone deep down in my soul. Restless place where stories roam, nights when I lie awake in a traceless haze of steam and smoke. There's a sister.
guess that I was blessed For I knew love Could know no shame when I held you to my breast And called your name Until the day I found An empty space The day I never let you go That was just beautiful. Please put your hands again together. That was stunning music. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a, a great treat. We have uh, two of Ireland's finest actors. And they're going to do a reading for us once we're set up. So please give a warm welcome for Angela Harding and Brian Murray reading an extract, O'Connor Street, 1913, from Strumpet City, Dublin Book of the Year. Aloysius Hennessy, replete after a breakfast of fried bread and tea, counted the stairs as he descended lightheartedly from his room to the hallway and emerged from its darkness into warmth and sunlight. The bells of Sunday were sounding over the street. The time was wearing up to midday. At a distance ahead of him, a figure hobbled in the same direction. The gait was unmistakable. Hennessy quickened his pace and caught up without difficulty. Are you going to Mass? he asked. I am, Rasher said, and dearly damn late at that. Whereabouts, Hennessy said, the pro-cathedral along with the quality. Oh, so am I, said Hennessy. I'll walk along with you. I like a Sunday, Hennessy said, leaning on the railings. Ah, come on, Rashers urged. What's your hurry? I'm bad enough without the addition of a mortal sin. We'll be late for mass. They turned into Delir Street and met the first section of the police. Oh, the Larkin Reception Committee, Rashers said. Do you think he'll turn up? As Hennessy asked, the vista of the street opened to them. Rashers stood still. Sections of police were placed at intervals up its entire length, from the bridge to beyond Nelson's pillar. They'd never seen so many policemen before. If he comes down in a balloon, Rasher said, I'll tell you this though, when he had seen the full strength of the preparations, if he does turn up, there'll be holy slaughter. After Mass, Hennessy wanted him to walk through Sackville Street again. Not for a knighthood from the king himself, Rasher said. I'd like to see if Larkin turns up, said Hennessy. You've the full use of both your limbs, but poor old Rasher's would be a sitting target for any murderous bowsy of a peeler. Ah, come on, Hennessy urged. No, Rasher's is home, be the back lanes. They parted. Hennessy adjusted the bowler and made his way back to Sackville Street. The crowd had increased. There was a small Larkinite element near the GPO. And near the Imperial Hotel, a stranger said to him, I don't think he'll turn up, do you? I don't see how he can, Hennessy said. What time is it? 
The man produced his watch. Waiting up to half past one. Oh, have a look at his nibs, the man said. Hennessy looked. A stooped, frock-coated old man with a beard and a tall silk hat was being helped from a cab by a coachman and a young lady. He leaned on her arm and paused to look about the street. They watched as the old man, still leaning heavily on the arm of the girl, was led into the hotel. People detached themselves from the crowd on the far side of the street and began to move towards them. Hennessy looked behind him. The figure of the frock-coated old man stood on the balcony above the street. Hennessy saw him straighten up and pull the beard aside. He flung out his arms in a gesture that by now was unmistakable. It's Larkin, the man behind Hennessy shouted. The crowd roared its recognition and surged forward. Larkin on the balcony shouted in triumph. I promised you I'd speak to you in this street today. I've kept that promise. I'll leave here only when they arrest me. Hennessy gazed upwards, thunderstruck. But in a moment, the police had reached the balcony and Larkin was seized. The crowd began to heckle. Uh-oh, trouble, the man with Hennessy said. Let's get out. But the pressure of the crowd tightened suddenly and lifted Hennessy off his feet. Over their heads, he saw the first wave of police, their batons drawn, coming at the double towards the crowd. His heart jumped with horror. He thought of his bowler. A belt of a baton would ruin it forever. His ribs were caving in. Every breath became an agonizing struggle. He was almost unconscious when the impact of the baton charge turned the crowd and it began to break up. Hennessy dropped to the ground. He lay there for some moments gasping. He felt his head, the bowler was gone. He searched about frantically on his hands and knees and found it again. He began to move down the street. There was no escape that way. Furious battles were being fought around the O'Connell Monument and across the length of the bridge. The victims of the first charge lay everywhere about him. He backed away from one policeman only to bump into another. The second struck him a blow on the shoulder which paralyzed the right side of his body. Hennessy went down like a log and lay still. The ambulance men brought him round. They lifted him up and found the bowler hat under him. It was dusty but intact. The news was bad that night. Two workers had been killed. Hundreds were hurt. The hospitals were thronged all day. And at night, the gas lamps were extinguished and the side streets were loud with pitch battles. Hennessy was able to limp his way home around five in the evening. His shoulder was dislocated, but the bowler still fitted. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Angela. We now have the Army number one band.
Thank you. If you were lucky enough to have visited the Dublin Tenham Experience in Henrietta Street recently, you will be familiar with our next performers. They are called Anu, and what they have to say speaks for itself. Tuesday and it's what? Five days, five days and his back's already against the ropes. Have you ever seen him? Have you ever heard him speak? Larkin. Larkin. I'll tell you that man, he's a force of nature. A freak of nature. See, my brother Dennis, he's a big Larkin, you know? Big Larkin fan. And he's been dragging me to Liberty Hall every night to hear him speak. But I tell you, it's something else. <laughs> I mean, to be sat there with hundreds of men of all ages, all fighting for the same thing, all fighting for the same cause. And the women. And every last one of them wearing the red hand badge. The union badge, you know. Well, I tell you, it makes me boast with pride. Now, yes, Miss Friday was a scorcher of a day. Me and Dennis went. There must have been, how many rows, would you say? So there was about a thousand. About a thousand of us. And Larkin was giving it the large one. Telling everybody to stay strong. And to stay together. That this was it. And you know what? I believe him. I believe him. I believe him. Because yeah. I believe that this is it. Now, we did say that none of us should go to that Bows and Shells match because there was a scab playing for one of the teams. And then it turned out that the scab was Jack Miller. Do you hear me? Jack Miller's a scab. So me and 12 others from our house, we went down to pick it. Now we got there around lunchtime. The game wasn't kicking off the tree, but we wanted to get there early. We wanted to give Miller a piece of our mind, and we seen him. Going in in his horse strong courage, and we ran after him. Scab! 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 The shame of it was unbelievable. The look on his face. I don't know how that man sleeps at night. Now we start getting out of hand after that though, and the tram, a tram like this one came over the bridge and the men start running and attacking it and shaking it. The tram nearly toppled over. People were throwing bottles and bricks, even jam jars. Sure, anything, I heard the women were worse. Anything they could get their hands on, Rosie. Now, I had a lead pipe myself, and as I ran to attack it, a shot was fired. I stopped. I looked all around for my brother Dennis. I couldn't find him anywhere. Now, he was all right. The tram driver let off his revolver. You see, Morphy has given some of his scab tram drivers revolvers to protect themselves. Keepers of the peace or something. This fella left one off in the air and everyone starts scattering all around the place. Dennis grabbed me from nowhere. Now we headed down Great Brunswick Street. You know that, don't you? 
Great Brunswick Street is down there. Of course they know where it is, Charlie. He wouldn't know it after last night, Rosie. The place was destroyed. Upended it was. You see, there was rioting and looting. The men were breaking into the pubs, (laughs) popping over the bars and serving each other. I seen one fella, right, drunk as a skunk he was. He walked out with a beer barrel, right? He picked it up and he threw it through a shop window, smashed all the glass, and then a woman walked in after him. See, it was a woman's shoe shop. She walked in, grabbed herself a pair of shoes and put them on her. She left her old ones there on display and she ran off. Down Brunswick Street she was. Look at me new shoes! Sure did shoes. I see a young one running down Cars Lane? In bitch she was. Only wasn't she dripping in jewellery. Big four coat, shoes too big for her. Running down the road screaming, Would you look at me now? Would you look at me now? Do you think that's bad? Me and Dennis headed on to Footbridge after that, and that's the last time I seen him. The last time I seen me brother, he was fighting about three or four constables himself. My brother the hero, but I helped him out. I didn't just stand there. I got one constable away from him and I hit him with myself. Caught him right in the mouth. I didn't see you there, Charlie. Yeah, I was there. I didn't see you there, there, Charlie. Look, he bit me hand, didn't he? And as he was there, I gave him one last kick and he stayed down. And he didn't move again after that. Now Larkin has said he's going to speak here today on Sackville Street, dead or alive. And he won't let us down. This is it. This is the start of it. I can feel it. We're taking no more. Are you with us? Charlie! Yeah. Are you what are you doing, Charlie? Yeah. What are you doing up there? My man's looking for you. Get down. I lost you on Foot Bridge. I'm after been looking everywhere. You're not going to find me up there, Charlie, are you? Now, come on. I'm heading out to Croydon Park. You can come with me. What are you going to Croydon Park for? Larkin's speaking out there today, so come on. No. Larkin said he'll speak here, dead or alive. Now, I'm not He's going anywhere. He's speaking out Croydon Park, Charlie. Don't take me up there. Come on. Well, What's going here? Dennis, will you stop? He'll be here. What's wrong with him? We don't know. He said he told me no. No. What's I wrong with you? I was talking to P.T. Daly yesterday before he locked himself in the Liberty Hall. He said Larkin's going to speak in Croydon Park today, so come on! Did you hear what happened to James Nolan? I seen it, Charlie. I seen it with my own eyes. Kept himself to himself. Didn't say a word to anyone. He had me with us all day. Nothing to do with it. Dennis. He walked out of the pub and down Eaton Key quite as a mouse. Then I heard him to a bunch of animals. There must have been about 30 or 40 constables all drunk. They've been drinking since Tuesday. They charged down Eaton Key, smashing every side lamp in sight and running their teeth like the animals that they are. Then I heard one of them shout, let's give it to them boys. To my God, did they give it to poor James Lowland. One of them ran full speed ahead, batting at the ready and smashed it all the top of Nolan's head. Then he stood on his shoulder. That wasn't enough. They seen poor Nolan try to get up. I was praying he'd stay down. The poor chap got barely stand. They bet him and they bet him till his skull was crushed. You can still hear the crunching sound of the bat. I know who it was and I'm not afraid to say it. Constable Bell number 224C, two, he led the attack, he hit Nolan in the head, and number 149C, he hit him in the head. I'm not afraid to say it, Charlie, you'll say it, Annie, won't you? Dennis, will you stop? You're going to get killed. They hit him and they hit him till he stopped me, Oman. Nolan was out cold. I knew he had enough. Before I knew it, I was shouting at him to stop. You damn cowards are shouting. Next thing I knew, I was on the floor, batting off the side of the head. Give us a look. Jesus, Rosie, he needs to get himself to the hospital. And I looked across and seen James Nolan lying on the ground, blood streaming from his head. He was just looking at me, Charlie. Just looking at me. Dennis, will you get yourself down to the Jervis? I'm not going to the Jervis, Rosie. That's where he took James Nolan, but I can tell you one thing, it's more than the hospital that man ain't it. Look at the state of you. What are you meant to say to me, ma? Clouds will keep you out of trouble. We know. I promise you one thing, there's gonna be justice for James Nolan's death. Murphy's running scared, I can feel it. They're trying to arrest him big Jim, but he couldn't keep him. Now they're trying to beat out of us like the cowards that they are. They can't pass and charge the whole lot of us, can they? No. no. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? Come yeah. on! Come on!
Come on. Is that it? Congratulations, Tiani. That was really brilliant. Please welcome Kira Sedin and Connor Brady back on stage. Thank you. Uh, this song we're going to do is a song that certainly would have been sung 100 years ago at the time of the 1913 lockout, and indeed before then. And I think it's best described as best described as a song that's about holding out for an ideal, regardless of the situation or the obstacles uh, in front of you. And I'd like to dedicate it today to the memory of trade unionist and great women's rights campaigner Rosie Hackett. It's called If I Prove False. Thank you. May she forge bridges yet. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Conor Brady on guitar. Thank you. Thank you, Kira, Sedin, and Connor Brady. Next up, we're going to have a, another reading of Strumpet City with Angela Harding and Brian Murray. It's such a, a beautiful, poignant day. I'll tell you, Kira Sedin captures a beautiful. Beautifully. So please welcome back on stage Angela Harding and Brian Murray. And the reading is the consequence and fallout of 1913 from James Plunkett's Strumpet City. We're going to put a stop to all this immediately, Bullman explained. No more Larkinism, no more broken contracts. I reported to the board on the meeting of the Employers Federation. They've agreed to a man to support the proposal of the Federation to outlaw Larkinism. All employees must sign it, whether they belong to Larkin's union or not. I thought you wouldn't be asked to sign it, Mary said. I wasn't. Fitz said, but I couldn't stay in when the others were locked out. I couldn't do that. I know you couldn't. Are you angry? No. I'm glad you wouldn't do something you knew you shouldn't do. It wouldn't work out in the long run. The gratitude in his face moved her deeply. She came to him and kissed him. Then she said, the children are the real worry. I know. I was thinking about it before you came in. If we put a little of what we have aside and never touch it, no matter how bad things may be, well, we know that if the worst happens, we'll be able to send them to stay for a while with my father. Yeah, we'll do that, he said. And then he thought about it and added, but you, you could go with them yourself too. That'd be better still. I wouldn't leave you here alone. He held her to him and said no more. If things became very bad, he could talk to her again about it, but they must wait. The gates were closed. The keys that could open them were in other hands. By the end of the week, Bullman had assembled the facts for his board. The 400 firms in membership of the Employers' Federation had stood firm. 32 trade unions had joined with the Larkinites in refusing to sign the form. The lockout was general throughout the city. Gates closed. Machinery came to a standstill. The city of Dublin was practically paralyzed. It was reckoned that about 24,000 men were involved, and in a matter of days, and for four long months, the streets filled with the hungry hordes that rashers had feared. By December, defeat became a certainty. At six o'clock, the whiskey bottle was empty. Father Giffley did not mind. He had the foresight to fill his hip flask with enough to meet the needs of the night. For the moment, he was happy to contemplate the empty sea, to explore at leisure the notions of immortality and eternity. He decided to commit something to the sea, a thing he had been fond of doing as a child. He found a pencil and tore a page from his pocket diary and scrawled, time takes all away. This was written by a madman on the shores of a mad island. By that time, the troop ship had cast off from the North Wall. Mary and Mrs. Mulhall were already on their way back to Chandler's Court. Fitz, the leave taking over, leaned on the rail of the ship, while below him the water of the river whirled past. On the quayside, every single thing was familiar, every shed, every crane that raised a bony finger along the south wall. At the pigeon house, where the river widened out, he saw the strand he had walked with Mary and the shelly banks where he had proposed to her. Another soldier said to him, you got a match? He took out his box. The soldier offered him a cigarette. He took it. The wind whipped at the match. He cradled the flame between his palms they lit up. His heart was full of Mary. Each moment that passed was putting its extra little piece of world between them. Each twist of the propeller 
carried him further and further from her. But she'd have the allowance. The children would eat. The rent would be paid. And in the Royal Army Service Corps, he'd learn to be a motor mechanic or a car driver. He'd be sure of a job when he came back. If he came back. That was as would be. The soldier seemed lonely and leaned beside him on the rail. He was from Dublin too. Funny feeling, isn't it, he said. The two of them smoked together. The black lighthouse loomed up and fell behind them as the ship cleared the river at last and swung into the bay. Bells tinkled remotely. Their speed increased. Ireland slipped away behind. Before them lay England and training camps. Beyond that, the continent, foreign tongues, unfamiliar countries, shattered towns, war. Father Gifley made his way up the lane again. The wasps were still busy about the hedges. The blackberries shone in the evening light. And he could still hear the never ceasing movement of the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Brian Murray and Angela Harding. It's a great book. On Tuesday, the 25th of August, 1913, James Larkin became aware of a proclamation publicly posted by the DMP forbidding public meetings by members of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. This was his reply. It's okay, I have a minute. Thanks. Yeah. I? No, 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 the second one. Can you uh, keep an eye on that or something? Um, well, where? Is it safe here? Oh, yeah, but it's here. Right. Apologies, that's an ar it's an army number one band now.
thank you very much. From the Army Number no. One Band. So it's Larkin Speech from the Tram. Yeah. All right, Rosie. The mission that I have come to preach is the divine mission of discontent. The employers of Dublin seem to think they have the divine right to use, misuse, abuse, and exploit their workers, and at the same time, deny those workers all rights even to combine collectively in a union. So, the workers of Dublin have sent me to say that they, the masters of Dublin, so-called, that they shall crucify Christ, Neymar, in Dublin town. The magistrate, Justice Swift, as you know, has banned our meeting on Sunday by his proclamation. I wouldn't be surprised if Mr. Swift was a shareholder on the tram line or the newspapers of William Martin Murphy. But we will be here on Sunday anyway, and you will be there also. And remember, for every one of our class that falls, two of theirs must fall for that one. Be here on Sunday. That's the great Gerald O'Leary as Jim Larkin. We'll see more of Larkin later. And now we have one of the great lockout anthems sung by Jimmy Kelly, accompanied on guitar by, sorry, by Pat Good. Great honor to be invited here today. And we're gonna sing a song Dublin City in 1913, written by Donna McDonough. In Dublin City in 1913, the boss was rich and a poor and slave. The women were working and the children hungry. When on came Larkin like a mighty wave. The workers cringed when the boss man thundered and 70 hours was their weekly chore. They asked for little and less was granted, less given little, they'd ask for more. Then on came Larkin in 1913, a mighty man with a powerful tongue. The voice of labor, the voice of justice, and he was gifted and he was young. God sent Larkin in 1913, a mighty man with a mighty tongue. He raised the workers, he gave them courage. He was the leader and the worker sung. In the month of August, the boss man told us no union man for him would work. We stood by Larkin and told the boss man we'd fight or die, but we were not sure. Eight months we fought and eight months we starved. We stood by Larkin to tick and tin. But foodless homes and our crying children, they broke our hearts and we could not win. Then Larkin left us, we seemed defeated. The night was dark for the working man. But on came Connolly with new hope and counsel. His motto was that we'd work again. In Dublin City in 1916, the British soldiers, they burned our town. They 
shelled our buildings and shot our leaders. The harp was buried beneath the crown. They shot my Kermit and Pierce and Plunkett. They shot my Donna and Clark the Brave. From Peak and Malin, they took their bodies to Arbor Hill to a quick line grave. But last of all of our gallant leaders, I'll sing you a song of James Connolly. The voice of labor, the voice of justice, who gave his life that men might be free. Whoa. Thank you, Jimmy, Kelly, and Pat Good. We now have the wreath laying ceremony with the President Michael D. Higgins. And he'll lay a wreath on behalf of the people of Ireland to mark their anniversary of the great lockout. red rose wreath symbolizing the labor movement. What? Okay, so we have David Begg, General Secretary of the Irish Congress of Trade Union, Francis O'Grady of the British Trade Union Confederation, Bernadette Segal of the European Trade Union Confederation, and Sharon Barrow of the International Trade Union Confederation. If you would please now observe a minute's silence. Please be upstanding for the National Anthem. <laughs> <laughs> 